focused on specific technologies that we are going to encounter with wide area networking options. And we begin our journey taking a look at frame relay. But before we do that, we'll take a look at ISDN and dial up. That's right, dial up. You may think, oh, come on, Anthony, this isn't a valid option. But for CCDA certification, it would still be considered a valid option. Still need to know about the dial-up wide area network access type. Remember, this would fall into the category of circuit switching. That's right, circuit switching. It is utilizing the public switch telephone network, and we establish a connection when we need to use this wide area networking option, and then we tear down that connection when we are done with the wide area networking option of a dial-up connection. This is an analog signal, isn't it? So the purpose of a modulator and demodulator is to take the digital communications of the computer, convert them into analog communications on the public switch telephone network, and the modem does this in reverse as well. So it modulates and demodulates the digital information into an analog signal. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, it's really, really slow. But one nice thing about dial-up access is it's an option just about everywhere, right? There is the public switch telephone network, which reaches out everywhere, and therefore we can piggyback dial-up connectivity on top of that. We better have technologies that can take low bandwidth. We know the, the theoretical is the 56K that we can achieve, but as my good friend Michael Shannon always says, he's a, a, a well-known IT instructor, Michael Shannon always says, you know what, if you're getting 56K out of your modem, your dial-up modem, then you better play the lottery because we know we're not getting a true 56K with the interference and all the other problems that we face when we're doing dial-up connectivity. Oftentimes today, nobody's relying on dial-up anymore. Okay, I'll admit that, except for maybe as a backup, right? in an absolute emergency when you have no other wide area network access type that you're using as a primary connectivity point. ISDN. ISDN is a technology that will allow us to take our phone line, to take the phone line and to go ahead and, in a purely digital mode, communicate over that what is traditionally analog phone line connection. Wow, so voice and data can be transmitted digitally over the public switch telephone network. I remember uh, when this first came out, it offered such bandwidth at the time that no one needed it, so the old saying for ISDN was, I still don't need it. <laughs> Again, a technology that at the time it hit, it was offering the higher bandwidth that people just really didn't have a need for. ISDN never really took off, by the way, like it could have and should have, maybe. Uh, well, not should have, but like it could have. ISDN came along at a particular time as other technologies were being developed and never really had the popularity that it was expected to have. We need to realize there are two flavors of ISDN. There is basic rate interface ISDN and there is primary rate interface ISDN. A lot of terminology is here that we have to master when it comes to this particular technology. Okay, so we have a lot of terminology to master. Obviously, BRI and PRI, the two overall flavors of ISDN. But then it gets even more tricky with the uh, terminology we need to master. For instance, our ISDN speaking devices, that's called terminal emulation equipment. 
Okay, terminal emulation equipment, easy. But there's non-native ISDN stuff, and there's native ISDN stuff, equipment. Our native ISDN equipment, equipment that was built to be ISDN ready, we call these TE1s, Terminal Equipment 1s. Non-native ISDN equipment is TE2 equipment. Wait a minute. How can we take something that's non-native for ISDN and make sure it can connect happily to the ISDN network? Well, this is done with what's called ATA, a terminal adapter. So we have our TE1s, which don't need a terminal adapter, and then we have our TE2s, which require a terminal adapter. I've taught about ISDN for a real long time, right? As you might guess, I've been teaching for nearly two decades in this uh, area, and, you know, obviously I've been teaching for uh, ISDN technologies for a long time. So one of the things that students would always tell me is like, oh my gosh, how do I, you know, how do I wade through all these acronyms? How do I wade through all this terminology when it comes to wide area networking? And again, I'm going to recommend, you know, maybe traditional paper-based flashcards, or you can always go with the very cool electronic flashcard stuff out there. One of my favorites is the application, it's freeware, called Super Memo. With the freeware version of Super Memo, you can just feed these terms in, and it will automatically present them to you each day in a randomized but intelligent algorithm. You rate how well you know the various terms, and then it will shuffle the deck of electronic flashcards accordingly. Very, very cool. And those are the kind of tools that you can uh, access to make sure you really master this stuff. All right. By the way, more terminology is coming here on the topic of ISDN. There are these Network Terminal 2 and Network Terminal 1 devices that are next. We're moving, by the way, from the ISDN devices themselves, and we're moving towards the ISDN provider with this story. So as we move from the devices themselves towards the provider, we have uh, these Network Termination 2 and Network Termination 1 devices. These, by the way, are our translation devices for the media. What's going on here is we've got a five-wire connection on the terminals that needs to be converted into a two-wire connection for what we call the local loop. Okay? The local loop is the cabling that makes its way into the home of the business, and it's a two-wire connectivity here. One thing that's interesting about these network termination devices is that in North America, the customer is responsible for the NT1. And in other parts of the world, the service provider will take care of the NT1. Now, because the customer in North America provides the NT1, you shouldn't be surprised that Cisco routers can come with the NT1 built right in. If you look at your Cisco router that has like a basic rate interface ISDN port, for example, it might feature a U, a literally a U underneath the port. That U designation is a way for you to, at a glance, see that the Cisco router does indeed have the NT1, the NT1, the network termination one, built right into the interface. How convenient. Why does it have a U designation to show you that a built-in NT1 exists? Well, because there are ISDN reference points that are utilized to describe where we might be having a problem in the ISDN infrastructure. So these reference points are important when we are troubleshooting or maintaining an ISDN network. Notice, between the ISDN switch up at the service provider and the NT1, the reference point, everything in between the NT1 and the ISDN switch is referred to as the U reference point. Ah, 
So no wonder why the NT1 built into a Cisco router has a designation of you. It's trying to communicate to you, okay, plug in this router and everything from the router up to the provider is the you reference point. Notice between the NT2 and the NT1, it's the T reference point. And then notice between either the ISDN ready TE1 or between the terminal adapter and the NT2, we have our S reference point. The only other reference point we need to master is the R reference point, and this is for the unique case where you have a non-ISDN native device that needs a terminal adapter. So the connectivity between the non-native ISDN device and the terminal adapter is referred to as the R reference point. With ISDN basic rate interface connectivity, there are two bearer channels. The two bearer channels are for bearing data. And there is one D or delta channel for signaling. You'll often see basic rate interface ISDN abbreviated for shorthand 2B plus D to remind us that there are two channels for carrying data and one channel for signaling. Each of these bearer channels in ISDN is going to operate at a speed of 64K. As you might guess, you can run multi-link PPP over the top of this in order to allow you to get that whopping 128K of bandwidth for sending data. And yes, I was being a little bit sarcastic there, wasn't I? Because what used to be a whopping amount, 128K, that's a joke to most of us now. In my small office, home office network environment right now, thanks to fiber optic to the home, I am able to download at a speed of 30 megabits per second, and I am able to upload at a speed of 18 megabits per second. So I have just shattered the 128K that would be available with ISDN uh, B channels bundled together. Absolutely shattered it, and for not that much more money. Okay, so yeah, these speeds do tend to look like a joke to us now. Oh, by the way, Am I actually getting 30 megabits per second? And am I actually getting 18 megabits per second on the uploading? No, no, again, those are the theoretical maximums that I purchased. But I gotta admit, I come pretty darn close. As a matter of fact, something I'll do on one of the breaks is I'll go ahead and run a test. And we'll go ahead and take a look, it'll be fun. We'll go ahead and take a look at what I actually am getting even though I'm paying for 30 over 18. By the way, the delta channel in basic rate interface ISDN, that delta channel is 16 kilobits per second. 16 kilobits per second is utilized for the signaling and, and framing and all that happy control traffic. Oh, by the way, speaking of signaling and framing, there's also 48K overall for framing control and other overhead in the ISDN environment. So the total ISDN bandwidth uh, for basic rate interface, if you were added all up, is 192. Yeah, that often confuses people because they're like, all right, I know I've got 128K for the bearer channels. I know I've got my 16K for the delta channel. Why does the total work out to 192? Well, the difference is the 48K of overhead that we're going to have with ISDN basic rate interface. ISDN primary rate interface, well, in the United States and in Japan, it is 23 bearer channels and one delta channel. The bearer channels are indeed at 64K, and so is the delta channel. If you include the overhead, this works out to 1.54 megabits per second. In other parts of the world, it's 
30 bearer channels and one delta channel. So we would find this like throughout Europe and in Australia for ISTN primary rate interface. We're seeing here technologies called time division multiplexing technologies, by the way. Time division multiplexing refers to being able to carve out multiple channels over one overall transmission medium and using these different channels for things like voice, video, and data. Time division multiplexing. And obviously, time division refers to there being these little windows of time for the various communication channels in the overall medium. This really got going with the public switched telephone network. In the public switched telephone network, obviously, we needed to be able to transmit multiple calls along the same transmission medium. So time division multiplexing is used in the public switch telephone network to allow these multiple calls over that identical. Time division multiplexing actually got its start way back in the days of the telegraph, when we were doing telegrams and things and fax machines and they came along. All of that technology utilizes this concept of time division multiplexing. When we have leased lines, remember we talked about the leased line option where we literally buy dedicated bandwidth for the purposes of our local area network. We buy this absolutely dedicated to us circuit. The circuits that are sold are measured in terms of bandwidth. Uh, it's called a DS1 or T1 circuit in North America. And it's going to provide 24 time slots, so that's 64K each, and one 8 kilobit per second control time slot. So time division multiplexing circuits uh, can make up our least line purchasing, and this is a dedicated circuit that we are going to utilize for wide area networking potentially in our infrastructure. So we took a look at dial-up technologies. We took a look at ISDN technologies. And we spoke of this concept of time division multiplexing, so you understand what that is all about. Let's go ahead and pause here. When we return after a break, we will go ahead and take a look at the next major technology that we want to cover with you. And that is none other than Frame Relay. Frame Relay, due to its complexity, will be a rather lengthy discussion. So let's go ahead and pause before we embark on a detailed study of Frame Relay.